Oh, we're doing pretty good. We'll get you out of here early. And that's always a good thing. Okay, this is actually a cartoon one of my students sent me last year. Uh, this is this is surprisingly surprisingly accurate and common. Uh, which is a tendency to drive away your best employees and, and not realize what the consequences of that are. Okay, 24 years ago, I published a book called Pitfalls of Optimization Development. That was one of the two books that came out of my five years of Pages Software. All the things that I sort of wished I had known going in. Uh, what I've found over the years is that, particularly the first three chapters, are pretty are largely universal to adopting any new technology or methodology. Some of the subsequent chapters really are more specific to object technology, and some of them, frankly, are out of date. But these, these pitfalls you'll run into all the time. Okay, what's that? Where are you going? Back here. So, using the wrong developers. Uh, I've mentioned that in reviewing failing projects, what I often see is that after the second deadline slip, they suddenly decide to go to an agile methodology, often in spite of the fact that literally no one on the team has ever used agile before. Or maybe one person has. But they think that as a team, in the middle of a late project, they can suddenly adopt agile, and it'll all be hunky dory and get the thing shipped and so on. I've seen the same thing happen with various technologies. You know, we're, this, it has to be built this way, and we're hiring developers who are not qualified or competent for that. Now, sometimes you have no choice. Pages. We're developing for Next Step and Objective-C. There were very few people at the time I was hiring engineers for Pages who had experience with Objective-C or Next Step. So I had to find people who had experience in some of the domains, such as word processing, or who had experience in object technology, or who I just knew were really bright developers and we're going to have to bring up the speed. Let's see here. Using the wrong metrics or not at all, we've talked about that. We had a whole lecture on that, we had three articles that you read on that. Uh, Frankly, I think no metrics at all is probably better than the wrong metrics, but you need some way of measuring your progress towards completion. This actually ties back to accelerate with small bites. The nice thing about a small bite approach is that at the end of the week, you know whether or not you completed that. Likewise, it's the same advantage of continuous integration, automated testing, and so on. It's like a week has passed, we've implemented this one feature, and the app is still working. You know what your progress is. The problem is you'll often find yourselves in development efforts where you're 18 to 24 months out, and you really have no idea what your intermediate status is. You succumb to the 90% fallacy. Oh, we're 90% done. Uh, when you really have no objective measurement. Lying to yourself and others, and I'm going to assume you actually read these. You need to be honest with yourself about where things actually stand. You especially need to be honest with others about where things stand. Now, my experience is that engineers tend to be honest because correct information is our most valuable commodity. If you're trying to work with an API, and you found out that the description of the routines in the API was wrong, that you actually had to have different values to make it work, you would be furious. It's like, wait, you know. Or, or you're using a new language and you're told, yeah, this is how it works, and you find out through experimentation it doesn't actually work like that at all. One of my uh, consulting jobs back 30 years ago, 1989, literally 30 years ago, was in developer technical support at Sun. I was doing technical support on development tools for Sun Microsystems at Unix-based workstations, Sun OS-based workstations. Uh, 
one of the first bugs I got reported in by an actual developer somewhere using this 1.0, yeah, 1.0, version of a C compiler uh, on Sun OS for 386 processors, was that they were getting bizarre results in their, their subroutine calls. So I'm there with, you know, like with a assembly level debugger stepping through stuff. And what I find is that the C compiler itself, under certain circumstances, is blowing the parameter stack when you call a subroutine. You make, you make a call to a subroutine, it pushes stuff on a stack. You do the subroutine, you come back, and it's incorrectly remarking the stack. And stuff's getting lost. Uh, and I, I remember the fury I felt at that. It's like, my gosh, if I were a C programmer and I found that my compiler was doing this, I would just be furious beyond words. I mean, that's like compiler design 101. Uh, you, you've got to get the parameter stack correct. So uh, I'm not sure I got off on that. Not identifying <laughs> managing risks. Uh, I've already told you the story in Eric with my memo with 13 risks I identified and was told to shut up an architect and within six weeks, 12 of the 13 risks had come to pass. A well-run software project is very aggressive at identifying and managing risks. You need to be constantly asking yourself, what could go wrong with what we're doing? Adopting a technology or methodology without well-defined objectives. This happens all the time. Oh, we're using this language or this methodology because it's the cool new one. What exactly do we expect to have happen differently from what we're having? There are vast, vast amounts of software running modern civilization that are written in COBOL and Fortran. And we're done with, if anything, mere structured development. There's nothing magical about technology or methodologies. They are just tools. And if you're adopting a new one, you have to know why you're doing it, and you have to count the cost as to what it's going to take you. Misjudging relative costs is part of that. If we're going to adopt this programming language, this methodology, what's it actually going to cost us? How long is it going to take for our people to get good at it? What is the likelihood of us inadvertently, either for, for say, a programming language, making all the rookie level mistakes in the programming language in our process of trying to get our product out to market. Scope creep, allowing the features to creep before it. Again, this is, this is a big reason why you have small bytes. Uh, there is a phenomenon, well known, well documented in literature. Y'all did requirements. Let, let me put it this way. Y'all did requirements documents, okay? When you started coding, how did those explode? You know, your requirements document said, we're going to do this. And suddenly when you went to implement, it's like, well, and we have to do all this to implement this. You will always find that, which means that you want to sort of severely constrain the big items, because each one of those is going to mul multiply into lots and lots of design implementation requirements. Uh, allowing the specification to drift or change that agreement. Attempting, which is just, you know, my, my mantra. The only way you keep a project on schedule is by dropping features. If the specification keeps changing, it keeps expanding. You're adding these big blocks to the end of the project. Attempting too much, too fast, too soon. My close friend Bruce Henderson, who's a man for many years, has start out stupid and work up from there. This is part of the reason why you had the demos today. It forced you to get something on the screen. I'm actually impressed with a lot of what your stuff did already. <coughs> but you had to make choices and trade-offs, didn't you? That's something that you had to show today. It's kind of like, okay, we're going to drop that, we're going to drop that, we'll just do this. By doing that, you're now in a better position to add features in a more logical sense. What you will often see out in industry is the big bang approach, which is 
Here are the 300 features we want, and we're going to release those all in 1.0. And the project goes on for two years, and you get to 1.0, and it's, it's a piece of junk. Abandoning good software engineering practices. Uh, Accelerate gives you the good software engineering practices, but often you'll find organizations will say, oh, we're using Agile. We don't need to have configuration management. It's like, are you nuts? <laughs> you know? Or we're using this language. Or we're using functional programming. Therefore, we don't have to do peer reviews. I mean, that may seem nonsensical, but you'll get stuff like that. They're using some new hot technology or methodology, and they just suddenly decide to abandon fundamental software engineering practices. This, this is actually what led to my whole inside out SQA diagram, as I think I mentioned it, Fannie Mae. <coughs> they were adopting object technology, and there's a manager, non technical manager, saying, Well, we're using objects. We don't need to do QA anymore, do we? It all just works. It's like, oh. I actually need to do more QA. Uh, political pitfalls. If this, and these all tie to adopting a new technology or methodology. This, this is very, very much, if you're going into an organization and as a development team or whatever, you want to adopt some new language, some new programming style, some new methodology, these are the things you have to worry about. First is you want to educate and enlist management before the fact. You just don't spring it on them and say, oh yeah, yeah, we're all you know, switching over to, what's, what's, what's the hottest new programming right now? Erlang. Erlang? <laughs> we're switching over to Erlang for all our apps. And management says, what? Why are we doing that? Now, if you can actually make a, a case for that, say, here's why it is, and this is why we're switching to it, and this is what it'll take to convert over, you know, they may say, you're nuts, let's stick with what we're doing, or they may say, sure, let's do a pilot project, if they're smart. Underestimating the resistance. Now, this is often, yes? With the programming language thing, does it ever, what if the team's like, we all like this language? Like this then you have to educate the management as to why you want to do the language. What if, I mean, I guess you can put more work into the research, but... You, the, the point is, is you don't want to spring it as a surprise because if you're adopting a new language and any problems come up, this, this, is, this, is, this is what you have to understand about politics. People will use things to beat you over the head whether or not it's actually your fault. So if you're adopting some new language or some new methodology, and you don't announce it, and you don't get management to sign off and make the case as to why you should do it, and so on. If there are problems for whatever reason, they'll say, oh, it's because you switched languages. You should never have done that. You should have stayed with what we had. Don't want to put yourself in that position. Underestimating the resistance. This is often the, I, I was just, who was I talking to? I was just talking to someone in the past few days in a completely different field. I think it was some sort of mechanical engineering field. Uh, and they talked about the challenge of upper management reading an article in a business magazine and saying, this is what we need to be doing. Uh, this is, that's very much what was happening, by the way, with object technology.